Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Robert Latham and his doctrine of the Trinity within his systematic theology. This is our final lesson on the Trinity. It's uh, pages 155 to 165. The section on the Trinity ran from page 65 to 165. So this is our final lesson on the Trinity. We're going to look at the attributes. Let's go to block one. God's triune nature and attributes. The attributes describe God's revealed character of his whole being. These attributes are coextensive with his usia essence. They are possessed by each hypostasis personhood of the Trinity, and they are not merely abstract qualities. They define God's divine nature which is more visible than the structure of his triune existence. But fundamentally, God is a personhood. And it's the energy actions of God that do display his attributes. These attributes describe what God is like. The definition, the attributes equal the aspects of God's nature possessed by all three persons, revealed through his energy action. They are mutually interpenetrating and coextensive with the Usia essence. Love and justice are indivisible attributes identical to God in his simplicity. So we basically in block one, we get the definitions taken care of. We have our definition of the divine attributes by Latham. And now we move into the categories of the attributes in block two. We begin with uh, an attributes that uh, describe the Trinity. There are communicable attributes, those in which believers can participate, like righteousness, truth, and goodness. We participate in these attributes by the grace of the indwelling Holy Spirit as uh, testified to in Galatians. The incommunicable attributes are those in which we do not share. Infinity, eternity, self-existence, attributes essential to God himself, attributes loaded on the, located on the fringe of this area, on the fringe of where communicable and incommunicable kind of overlap, are things like omnipresence, because we do participate in God's presence and true knowledge because we do participate in God's true knowledge. So those we do actually participate in. Then there are absolute attributes, those without which God would not be God. Infinity, eternity, omnipotence. And then there are relative attributes, those involved in God's relationship to creation. He is creator, Preserver, holy, patient, sustainer. Also, wrath is a attribute in response to sin. Then we have attributes that become names. Naming how God reveals himself. God comparing himself to an element of his creation. Figures of God acting in judgment toward Judah. Like in Hosea where he is described as a lion. And Christ, we know, is described as a lamb. So there are names that uh, do accommodate a comparison and analogy that are taken up from creation itself. And then we close out the end of this study in the Trinity with uh, a proper closing. We close out with worship, and I think that's the perfect way to conclude a study on the doctrine of the Trinity. We conclude with worship. We began with a desire to learn and to be informed and uh, enlightened by the Holy Spirit. We close with worship. Block three. Triune attributes worthy of worship. Essential names where God is described absolutely. Spirit, love, light, life. The foundational attributes through which we know God in himself. I'll be his name. Worship God is to be worshipped through his image, 
Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, through whom we encounter God's beauty and God's glory through the triunity within his incarnation, a glory toward which the signs of the kingdom point. The biblical foundation for worship is John 4, 23 and 24. And uh, in uh, the interview I saw online of Robert Latham, he mentioned this verse also in his interview. So this is a key verse for him. John 4, 23 and 24, we are to worship God. Remember, this is at Jacob's well. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. God accommodates himself to our capacities in this intimate worship. He is made visible in Christ, who is the truth. So, beautiful, conclusive lesson to our study in the Trinity. And Robert Latham is considered the uh, current theological authority on the Trinity. He won't call himself an authority on the Trinity. He said there's no such thing as an authority on the Trinity. It remains a mystery, but... He is the leading theologian in this area. And so within his systematic theology, he gave uh, 100 pages to the Trinity, 65 to 165. And uh, we've really gained a tremendous amount. Because he began with Scripture. We began in the Old Testament, which I thought was great. And then we took a look at the uh, unity of will in the triune Godhead. Because the divine will is located in the unified nature, the usia essence. Therefore, the entire trinity is involved in creation, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. The entire trinity is unified in a harmonious act of will. And then uh, toward the end of our study, we even got into some contemporary theology. We had a chance to take a look at Jürgen Moltmann, a very significant figure in Christian theology and in the Trinity. And so I'm glad that uh, Professor Latham did go there. And then a beautiful way to close out, we close out with the attributes, the triune nature and the attributes and the categories of the attributes and attributes that are worthy of worship. That's going to wrap up our final lesson, pages 155 to 165. And uh, that'll wrap up our uh, scheduled December study on the Trinity. So that will conclude Robert Latham's Doctrine of the Trinity, the book within the book of his systematic theology. And we'll discuss our next project in our next meeting.